The Quiet Violence of Dreams by K. Silver Dyker. Chapter 1 Tepo. There is no one to blame. It's about me. It's always been about me. I accept that now. But I still find it hard to explain what really happened, what was really going on in my life. There's a part of me that will never be the same again. I feel like I've lost something or got lost in something too big to describe with easy words. So much happened in such a short space of time. I don't even know where to begin to look for the answers. So for now, I live with questions. Every day, I ask new questions and every day the answer seems more elusive. It is not easy living with questions. There is enough uncertainty in life as it is. The truth is I want to fly, to spread my wings a little and feel the warm air form curly cues under my arms as I glide. I want to close my eyes forever and let forever embrace me secretly. I want to be the beloved for a change and not know love as an unreliable friend always making promises. Is that so much to ask for? Look, these are not excuses. I'm trying my best to say what happened. I was desperately alone. I was running, barely holding on to my life with my teeth. Life was vicious. It left me no options. Things were ugly. I was drowning in my own life, my own events. I had spells. I lost time. Things just happened, really. I couldn't control myself. And I've been running away ever since. I've searched my mind for a word to describe this terrible feeling left inside. This hollow ugliness that is always with me when I close my eyes. It's too vile. So I tell a friend in the tradition that people tell their loved ones things. Important things. And friends, like apples, are sometimes sour. But like apples, we remember them for the days when they were sweet and full of sun. I remember the rain mostly, and the disheartening feeling that it would never end, I say to her. That it would rain with so much volition, so much conviction, that it would drown out the memories and cries that are haunting me. She doesn't say anything. She just listens, her head slightly bent forward, as if deep in thought. I look at her eyes. They are dark and hold secrets. I go on. I don't sleep well. I eat too little and I smoke too much. I wish for death constantly and sometimes at night when I sleep, I catch myself falling, dying. But I always wake up and I feel depressed. And that feeling is there. I cannot escape it. I cannot describe it. It's just too ugly. I have seen too much ugliness and it has made me painfully awkward. I was going mad because I got a little curious. I flew too close to the sun and my fascination with it and fell very hard. Uh-huh. She says, and licks her lips. Is that all you're going to say? Is that it? Because if it is, it's a bullshit story, Tepo. How? You cannot expect me to go on that stuff. Come on. Sometimes when you can be so selfish, so heartless, I say, a little angry. Well, Obatam, you're not helping. You're like my fucking therapist. You're giving me an inch of sympathy and I'm pouring out my life to you. Oh God, here we go again. You're such a drama queen. You're just looking for excuses to justify what you did. Bona, you can't carry on like this. I can't think of an immediate response, so I brood in silence. The air is still and is affected by the luscious smell of a nearby lake. It is hot. The heat stifling thought. <laughs> My face burns slightly. Mavatu doesn't seem affected by the heat. My head starts to itch, so I scratch violently. Perhaps I want a little attention. Why don't you just take it off, she remarks, pointing to the cap I wear. I take it off and keep scratching. Tepo, please, she says, putting her hand on mine. Don't give up on me. I know that you're disappointed, I admit. She's taken aback a little, but remains attentive. Mabatu is one of those people that never gush forward with emotion. It's too messy, I imagine her saying. She hardly ever spills out her feelings unless they are indignation or disapproval. I suppose she saves it for her acting classes. Okay, but you can't do that. She comes back. What? Scratching my head? Not that, and you know what I mean. Why are you making me say it? I'm trying to understand. 
Look, you can't smoke 400 zols a day because, 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 I know, I know, I cut her off. You don't understand, I say to myself. Excess is a seductive god. She will let you into her secrets if you follow her way a little. Mabato looks at me with incomprehension, with the discouraged look of a teacher who can't get through a student. I don't understand you. Are you trying to throw away your life or something? Do you think this is a joke? The fact remains, cannabis-induced psychosis. Isn't that what your psychiatrist said? So? Okay, fine. I say, irritated. I get the point. Teppo, you're making this hard and it doesn't have to be. Don't patronize me. It's easy for you to see that. You're not in my position. That's right. I'd never allow myself. I only said it because... Because, because, I know what I said, but I thought I was invincible then. I thought I could do anything, but what I didn't realize was that I have to want to do it. You know what I mean? I need to want it bad enough so that I don't have to smoke Zol before I get off my ass. But I do. For now, I do. That's weak. You know what they're calling you, she says, a defeated look on her face. I look at her. Mad cow disease. Is that how you want to be known? I mean, for fuck's sake, just wake up. This thing is destroying you. But you're also smoking it. That's not the point. You're changing the subject. She gets irritated. We sit together in silence. The sun beats. Words have made us strangers temporarily. I feel angry with the world, with life, and its fastidious order of things. There is so much that I don't understand in this... There is so much that I don't understand, and the riddles seem to be getting more obscure. Too much has been said about my condition, my illness, whatever it is. I don't know what to call it. This thing happened to me because, because. I'm sick of the endless explanations that come with it. The lies and cover-ups, the injustices and humiliation of it all. The indifferent nurses and psychiatrists who only communicate through prescriptions. Heavy prescriptions that dull your senses and seem to drain life force out of you. I'm sick of this familiar feeling of indignation. It's too tiring, too overwhelming to always be angry with life. Always questioning, why me? Why this? And this drug, what does it do? Will it take away this ugly feeling? Will, it, will I be able to sleep? Will I have my life back? It's too much. It makes my hands go cold and ties my stomach in knots. After a while, anger just takes over your life and comes out in cynical bites when you speak. My protests seem like insignificant drivel in the greater scheme of things anyway, whatever that means. I'm tired of therapy. I'm sick of trying to get to the root of things. All roots seem just to lead to more roots and more roots. Creation is a mad affair after all. It has no end. And that's what I need. An end. If not, at least, an answer or some semblance of conclusion. What does cannabis-induced psychosis mean? There is more to it than that. This is what the medical profession will never understand. I'm looking for a deeper understanding of what happened to me. Not an easy answer like cannabis-induced psychosis. And why don't they say it if they truly don't understand what happened? Why blame it on cannabis? It's too exhausting to be like this all the time. I'm tired, hungry. Washed up at 23, I keep thinking, and I try to force myself to do something, but I can't. Time is against me. I feel seconds ticking in my veins as I breathe. Minutes are outnumbering the hairs on my body. Hours are disappearing with each nail that grows. Forever and ever. It's frightening. Time is frightening. It's like dominoes fall endlessly into oblivion, and forever itself is too daunting. There's no way back. No back door to sneak through. I can't undo the mistakes I tripped over. Everything counts and very little is remembered. Forever. It's the only answer life gives us. And we are expected to fit it into some neat equation with death and a blissful afterlife. It's too much of a task. It's all too mad. I begin to feel anxious again and calm myself by scraping off flaking paint from the bench. Mabatu blocks off the sun's rays from her eyes and looks ahead in the distance. There isn't much to see, just more buildings and faint suggestions of trees. Her bleached crop of untamed hair glistens in the sun and her mahogany complexion seems to shine. In my dreams, Mabato is the woman who ran away with the sun and had an affair. 
It seems like a strange way of thinking about someone, but I often think of her as a sun child because I know how much she likes being out in the sun, soaking up its sensuous rays. I like her most when she's quiet. There is something regal about the way she holds herself, an ability to gather strength, summon courage, as if calculating the storm ahead. She sits with her legs crossed, a bright sarong with a wildflower print falling to her thick ankles, her feet clad in heavy dark martins. She has an imposing presence about her, hard to ignore. There is nothing delicate about her looks except for her long eyelashes, but there is something about her strong Amazon-like features. When I first saw her, I remember thinking she could give birth to a whole rugby team and she would still have energy and grace. There was just something indomitable about her, a spirit that reminded me of rural women toiling in the fields, a sense of coarse feminine strength. One could never guess where she grew up from the way she dressed. Her wardrobe gave too many conflicting clues. She's the only person I ever saw who wore jeans and a Tosa head wrap and pulled it off stylishly. The first thing she ever said to me when I first met her was that my eyes were big and something about them revealing too much. I was struck by her boldness and didn't like her immediately. Keptonians take themselves too seriously, I remember thinking after she said that. I was annoyed. She seemed to have an opinion about everything and there was something about her that I couldn't trust. A worldly air about her that always made her the center of attention. For a while, we kept on running into each other at parties and bars, and invariably, I would end up with her on some couch in the corner talking about something neither of us really cared about. It was more about sussing each other out, trying to measure the depth of each other's character. If experience meant having traveled a lot and leaving behind a trail of jilted lovers, then she was more experienced than I. She went so far as to tell me that she'd slept with a woman. She thought I would be shocked, but I wasn't. I wasn't different. Besides, I'd grown up in Joburg. In time, she wore down my defenses with charm, but not, not the syrupy kind that oozes with the need to please. I found her charming to watch. I liked the way people responded to her. Maybe that has something to do with the fact that she's a drama student. We sit like that for a while, each of us quiet in our thoughts. She's an artist. A thought comes to me, a great silence artist. She's mastered silence. I watch her, the sun seducing her soft skin. We should go inside, I finally say. She nods, a shadow of distress on her face. Look, there's nothing to worry about, I offer. I'm gonna get through this. Where now? She says in a concerned motherly tone and points her finger at me. I say nothing. We get up and go inside.